Colonel James Van Stratton, um, your memoir's title is A Different Face of War. What does that title mean to you, or why did you go with that title? Well, I, I think I really did see a different face of war, totally unknown to most Americans, that which I experienced in Vietnam. And uh, it was about, much about the humanitarian effort that accompanies war. Mm. And uh, people who've read the book are amazed at some of the things that I encountered during that year. And it really was a different face of war. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very unique memoir. You know, I've, I've read by now many, many dozens of, of Vietnam memoirs. And um, this one is unique. You know, I haven't read one like, like U this. Unique yeah. in what sense? Well, in, you use the word humanitarian, and I, I think that's it. I mean, this, this book, this book um, I think, really shows that the hearts and minds program, for lack of a better way of putting it, was for real, that it wasn't just uh, a cynical ploy or it wasn't some side note, um, you know, that it, that you know, that the, it, was, it was for real. A, a there, lot of Vietnamese benefited from it, as we'll see. There it's, is no doubt that it is for real. Yeah. I, I recently read a book, and I wish I could na remember the name of the author or the title of the book, but I can't at the moment, but uh, he pointed out that he thought he came to the conclusion that rural Vietnamese lives improve marginally as a result of the humanitarian efforts that were going on, mm. the pacification programs that were mm -hmm. in place when I arrived. Yeah, and that would be in general, but then as we'll, as we'll see as we go through this, for a lot of individuals, their lives were improved radically. Absolutely. For a lot of individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's, that for me is a very interesting thing, thing especially when I, when I contrast it with I mean, just a, a veteran, I've, a Vietnam veteran I've spoken with just most recently, who not only saw combat, but saw some of the closest face-to-face -face sort of fighting that, that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a stark difference, um, it, pretty much in, in every respect. So let's, let's come back to the, the, the cover of the book. So a different face of war, you know, a different perspective on the war, given your work. And your work involved um, um, service with the Medical Service Corps, the Army Medical Service Corps. Just tell us about that, because again, that's something yeah. that folks for, have for me it about. was Dr. Jones, for me it was the perfect fit to get into the Medical Service Corps. And I mm. attribute my getting into that corps through the efforts of one kindly priest. He was the chairman of the biology department at St. Norbert College, where I did my undergraduate work. Yeah. And uh, he had served as a chaplain with a medical unit in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Oh, yeah. And then he came back to St. Norbert College after the war and became the chairman of the biology department and ultimately the dean of the institution. But uh, he steered many of his graduates toward the Medical Service Corps. Yeah. And I, I feel indebted to the man. He's long since gone. Yeah. He's deceased. But I can name at least uh, 15 or 20 Medical Service Corps officers who've done very well in the Corps. Hmm. Uh, and he steered all of them into the Corps. Do you, do you think this priest did that? Because I mean, he had his own experience. Was that partly a way to serve the country, but also to be, or serve the country in the military, and also, though, to be involved in the sort of the healing side. Do you think I that suspect was one of his that I suspect that was a big part of his motivation. Uh, yeah. But he talked openly about his experiences in the medical unit, wow. and he just thought it was the perfect fit. And yeah. and it was because you know most people don't know what the medical service corps is all about, and one way of defining it is to tell you the composition of the Army Medical Department. Yeah. The Army Medical Department is divided in, it has six officer corps. One is the medical corps, all physicians of the various specialties. Mm -hmm. Another is the nurse corps, mm -hmm. nothing but nurses commissioned in that corps of the various specialties. Another is the veterinary corps, and as you might imagine, all veterinarians involved in working dogs and food supply and yeah. the things that veterinarians do. Another was the dental corps, right. nothing yeah. but dentists. 
Another was the Army Medical Specialist Corps. Hmm. And in that corps, they had occupational therapists, physical therapists, hospital dietitians, and physician's assistants, those wow. four specialties. Yeah. And everything else that you can think of that is connected to medicine yeah. belongs to the Medical Service Corps. Yeah. Let, let me just give you an example. Probably the most visible on the battlefield was the aeromedical evacuation pilots, mm -hmm. medivac, mm -hmm. commonly called dust off. Yeah. And uh, you know, they evacuated over a million people during the wow. Vietnam War, a yeah. million people. Now, how yeah. many lives were saved as a result of their heroic actions? Oh, sure, yeah. well, nobody knows, but right. that's one core. But then yeah. all of the optometrists, the pharmacists, the podiatrists, the clinical psychologists, the social workers, all of the laboratory specialists, the various specialty yeah. areas, all of the hospital administrators, all of the trainers, all of the logisticians, all of the medical equipment repair persons, the people that kept the equipment going and calibrated, yeah. all of those specialties plus more were lumped into the Medical Service Corps. Wow. So it was a very large and very diverse group of people. Yeah. I happen to be in the training element. It was called plans, operations, and training. Yeah. And I spent much of my career in the training area. And in Vietnam, uh, from what I gather from the memoir, you're spending a lot of time helping to train the South Vietnamese to exactly. improve their own and medical In fact, system. that's a good point, because yeah. I always thought that the term, that the title that we were given, that I was given when we went to Vietnam, an advisor to the Vietnamese was far too narrow. Yeah. It was broader than that. We assisted them, we advised them, we helped train them. Yeah. Well, and so that, that gets to one of the one of the questions um, I was reading last night in the memoir, and you commented on how, you know, uh, operations. I believe at a hospital. This is near the end, near the end of the memoir. Operations at a certain hospital, uh, run by the South Vietnamese, Vietnamese, seem to be going well. There are other places in the memoir where there's a lot of inefficiency. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of frustrating. When you look back on your, your tour in Vietnam, 1966-1967, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, when you look back on that society or as you thought about it at the time, did it seem like, just f given what you saw, did it seem like it was a society that, you know, could, within a space of years, be, a, be, a, be at a place where it could stand on its own feet and be a functional I, I certainly think so. I, I, yeah. During the year I was there, Preston, I gained tremendous respect for the Vietnamese people. I liked them. They were, they were motivated. Yeah. They were resilient. They were eager to learn. You know, so many Americans, uh, mm -hmm. it seems to me, uh, badmouth the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, our, sure. our allies. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I always thought it was unjust mm. because, you know, you look at it from this perspective. Yeah. When we went to war in 1965 as an ally yeah. of the Arvin, that army, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, had only been in existence less than 10 years. Mm. Mm -hmm. they, they were formed on the 30th of December 1955. Yeah. Now, you tell me, I wonder what our army looked like after 10 years. <laughs> I wonder what it looked like in 1785. Yeah, I hear but, that. But here mm -hmm. was in our, and you know, mm -hmm. two or three times presidents of the United States sent the acknowledged expert on counterterrorism, a, man, a British officer, Mm. by the name of Sir Robert Thompson. Mm. They sent him to Vietnam to make an assessment of what was going on. And he came back to the United States and reported, I believe, to Lyndon Johnson for sure, and the other one was either John Kennedy or Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. but he reported to two presidents that he considered the Arvin the third best army in the free world. Mm. All right. Third only to the United States, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and the Arvin Third. Mm, yeah. he, he, he thought the, a very capable fighting force. Yeah. Now, when you talk to many Americans, perhaps most Americans, yeah. they don't see it that way. Yeah. 
Yeah. But, but strangely, the people that work closest with the Arvin, the advisors, right. respected them greatly. Hmm. I have run into very, very few advisors to the Arvin who, who don't respect them greatly. Yeah. Very few. So this is, this is not a, a topic that comes up in your memoir. You do express your, your admiration for the, the South Vietnamese. Um, of course, there are frustrations and, and difficult moments, but on the whole, that's the, that's the spirit of it. Um, and you don't address the question I'm going to ask you now, um, and so therefore you may not yeah. have a response for it, but I'm just wondering, what, um, what do you think happened then? Because um, um, once the U.S. You know, pulls out of South Vietnam mm -hmm. with the Vietnamization program, I mean, within a relatively short time, the... Uh, Republic of South Vietnam is is overrun. Do you have any thoughts about kind of was it political corruption that you know w in the in the political class that kind of sucked the spirit out of things? Who or knows? What, what are your uh, thoughts about that? The, the political corruption, if it existed, I don't know that it existed. I suspect it probably did, mm. but it was way above my pay grade. Sure. I was there as a major. Yeah. I saw a lot of troops on the ground. I interacted with a lot of their senior leadership. Mm. I never saw the corruption openly, but I suspect yeah. it was there. Yeah. But, uh, I th you know, when Creighton Abrams took over from Westmoreland, there was a period of time when, uh, when things were looking very good, when things were looking quite good. You can talk to people who were there at the time. They said the countryside was relatively safe. They could move around in their Jeeps in the countryside when they couldn't previously. Mm. But when word about the Vietnamiza Vietnamization came out and uh, then they announced our withdrawal, the date, it just kind of took the wind out of everybody's sails. Yeah, you I know, and, and here the, the North Vietnamese Army, which was a formidable force, plus the Viet Cong, and the North Vietnamese Army is being well supplied by the Chinese and the Russians yeah. with weaponry and yeah. were pretty well trained too. Yeah. You know, they became a formidable force. Sure, yeah. Well, and as you write in your memoir, I mean, you, there's a, you know, just one passage I have in mind. Uh, I believe it's a letter that you're writing to your wife uh, that you have in, in the memoir. You do describe the incredible tenacity of the NVA and the, yeah. and the VC. Yes. They'll, just, they'll get hammered on the battlefield, but they'll- They're they'll, right they'll back. Be, they'll They're right back, back for yeah. more. Preston, all you had to do was go into the POW camp, which I did many times. They had one in, in Da Nang, on the outskirts of Da Nang, yeah. over by the Naval Support Activity Hospital. Yeah. And all you had to do was go in there and see the steely resolve in the eyes of those prisoners. You mentioned that. And uh, it was just an incredible experience. I remember right, even some of those prisoner, those prisoner combatants, combatant prisoners were women, if I remember correctly. Many were women. Many yeah. were women, and and the resolve was just as great in their eyes as it was in the in yeah. the male combatants. Yeah. Well, to to get you know to touch on on this theme of respecting the South Vietnamese, there's a story you tell about a barber, and yeah. uh, and the barber you tell is uh, you know or the the story you tell is of a guy who took tremendous pride in his work and was very efficient and very reliable. When the story of the barber came up, I thought I knew where it was going because I've, I've heard stories about barbers before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at least three times I heard about the barber on base, who's a really nice guy, who cut our hair by day. And then one night there was a firefight, and it turns out one of the sappers was mm -hmm. the barber. So mm -hmm. he's with us by day, with the VC by night. And I assumed that's where your story was going. Yeah, but it but didn't. didn't. <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> and and yeah. who knows, maybe after my departure, yeah. perhaps it did, but I doubt it. But I doubt yeah. it. Yeah. But, but he was a wonderful young man. Yeah. And he took such pride in his work, which, yeah. which I appreciate seeing. Work is important. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he took such pride. And I know that I used to, just as a kind of a courtesy, visit his shop every so often to inspect it to see if he was handling his instruments correctly and if he was good using good techniques as far as cleaning his barber instruments. Sure. And they worked up a little certificate and I gave it to him. Right. And 
such tremendous pride in that certificate. It, it hung in his office, right. I know, until the day I left. Yeah, and, uh, yeah you described yeah. this. So this, this is one of the, really, I think, the most unique thing um, uh, about the memoir. Uh, let's um, let's uh, look at, um, at some photos that, that we have. Uh, another thing about your memoir is there's a theme that comes up several times, and that is a sort of a fundamental difference in view on how the war should be prosecuted. Oh. And there's General Waltz on the one side, General Westmoreland on the other. How would you describe that, um, that difference in view oh. of how the war should be prosecuted? Preston, you're absolutely right. The divide was so wide, so yeah. wide. And yeah. um, I had tremendous respect for General Walt. I, now he's in command of I-Corps. He's the commander of I-Corps. He yeah. was a Marine. And, yeah. uh, and General Westmoreland initially, I thought, was on the right track. Because for the first six months that I was in Vietnam, the emphasis was on pacification. There is no doubt in my mind, and there's no doubt in my mind that it was working and working yeah. well. Yeah. But then about halfway through my tour, the emphasis changed appreciably greatly, and the emphasis was on attrition. How many enemy combatants could we kill? How many bridges could we bomb? Mm. How many, you know, numbers, mm. numbers. So pacification, that's hearts and minds. Hearts, hearts and, and minds, mind. hearts and minds. We yeah. had so many good things going on in an I-Corps, mm. um, and General Walt was so supportive. I mean, everybody was working together. We were improving their elect electrification of their country. We were improving their medical support. Mm. We were improving their policing system. Uh, we were improving their farming methods. Everything was on track. And mm. we were, I thought, doing great things. And I thought the results proved themselves. But um, mm. it came to, I won't say it came to a halt, but it was uh, a secondary yeah. mission after about the midpoint of my tour. And I served from 1966 to 1967, from July of 66 to July of 67. So you observed this, uh, you observed this transition from uh, an emphasis, or at least um, hearts and minds, that, that program, pacification, right. is, is there's a lot of energy going into that. Right. And you, you, you detected in the course of your tour that becomes less important and uh, basically body count becomes more Absolutely, important. and it frustrated General Walt so badly. Mm -hmm. Every time he would be summoned to Saigon for a meeting with General Westmoreland, he would come back to I-Corps mm -hmm. somewhat depressed, mm -hmm. somewhat depressed. Mm -hmm. And they had a problem, they had a fundamental problem with the command structure too, yeah. because General Walt uh, was also beholden to his boss sitting in the, in the Pacific, General Krulak, Brute Krulak. Mm -hmm. And uh, Krulak was a firm believer in pacification. And in fact, he wrote a book about pacification. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he impressed General Walt with his ideas and General Walt was in agreement. But then uh, General Westmoreland, the overall commander, and obviously General yeah. Walt had to take his orders from General Westmoreland, yeah. shifted emphasis. And it seemed, it seemed as if uh, Secretary McNamara was intimately involved, mm. that he was the person that was pushing the war on attrition. He wanted numbers. He was a number cruncher. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it just demoralized the advisory effort. Yeah. You know, it's interesting just on that theme, and you, this doesn't come up in your memoir, but something I've noticed over the years reading about Vietnam, talking with Vietnam vets, is um, the number crunchers back in D.C., you know, the data said we were winning but the 19-year-olds on the ground knew we weren't. And I've always been interested in that divide, how the 19-year-olds actually on the ground, yeah. they can see what's happening. They can see what's happening. And th there's a difference between data and human beings. Absolutely, and we could see what was happening, too. Yeah. I yeah. express that in my book in a couple of occasions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So if I, if I, you know, tell me if this is right, my perception of General Walt's, General Walt's thinking is that, look, if we want to win these folks 
uh, if we want to win them to the non-communist side, and if we want to keep them on the non-communist side, and most of these peasants are not ideological and couldn't care less about Karl Marx or Thomas Jefferson. Correct. They're just peasants, and they, they want to just live their lives. But if we can win them over with pacification programs, the stuff that you write about mm -hmm. in, in your memoir, um, we're more likely to win them over that way, and we're more likely to keep them that way than if, as a result of the... Um, uh, what's what's the right phrase? The, the body count, the um, attrition, the attrition, war, war, of attrition. war of attrition, which which inevitably leads to more crops being destroyed, more villages being destroyed, greater brutality. Um, it's it's more likely we'll win and keep folks if we fix hair lips and things like that mm -hmm. than if we're you know getting into situations mm -hmm. where we're blowing up their villages. Yeah. That, is, that was that his basic thinking. That, I mean, that is that's, that's, that's you you've summarized it very well. And yeah. uh, the and the problem with pacification is. It takes time, mm. and the administration was unwilling to give us that time. Mm. They wanted the timeline speeded up. Yeah. You know, you don't win the hearts and minds overnight. You win mm. it over the long term. Mm. And it seemed to me that the country itself lent itself to pacification because 95% of the people lived in the coastal lowlands the villages, it was a very rural country at that time, yeah. but relatively, relatively easy to protect the villages while you're working with the people mm -hmm. in a pacification effort. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, General Westmoreland didn't want that. He wanted well, the U.S. forces to go after them. And yeah. so we chased them around the coastal lowlands, uh, frequently never mm -hmm. finding them. Mm -hmm. They blend in with the population he very easily. You mentioned that, and of course yeah. a lot of folks in Vietnam mentioned that. Just How can we win this thing if we don't know who's friend or foe? Exactly. Um, so you mentioned the time pressure, and that is also another theme that, that comes up, just the idea that I think even your dad, if I, remember right, if I remember correctly, even your dad wrote you a letter which seemed to express a little exasperation. He wrote me you know. several letters that expressed his exasperation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I could understand it, but uh, the American people, it seemed, uh, they wanted it speeded up. Yeah. And, and the especially the administration. Sure. Lyndon Johnson wanted to get back to his Great Society program right. yeah. and implement that. Sure. And, uh, yeah. you know. And on the other side, as you say in your memoir, you have an enemy that is willing to take as long as it takes. As long as it takes. Yeah. And it became very obvious that, sure. that time was relatively unimportant to the enemy, yeah. but of great importance to us. And losses. And there losses. A, a willingness to absorb just Willingness to absorb losses. tremendous losses. Yeah, just, yeah. Just think now, the, the numbers of people killed in that war. Yeah. The, you know, the official estimates from the government of Vietnam didn't come out until 1995 wow. when they tried to make an accurate assessment. Yeah. The estimates are two million civilians killed in that war, two million. Wow. One million, one hundred thousand enemy combatants, yeah. 250,000 Arvin, and our losses were 58,200 and some. And then the Australians and the Koreans lost some as well. Yeah. So, you know, mm. tremendous loss of life. Mm. Fourth costliest war in the history of the United States. Wow, yeah, yeah. Fourth only to the Civil War, the World War II and World War I, wow. and the Vietnam War next. Yeah, and interestingly, I mean, you know, in those four wars, this is the only one of those four, this is the one that takes place in a relatively undeveloped, poor country. Right. And yet the enemy is incredibly, incredibly tenacious. Right. So if what, from the American perspective, looks like a long, a, a, a long prolonged war. From the right. Vietnamese perspective, looks like, in you know, in our wars with the Chinese, in a historical perspective, this is a this is nothing. Right. Yeah. Very, very difficult. If it practice. has to go on two decades, let it go on. From their perspective, yeah. And from our perspective, let's bring it to a close and bring it to a close fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's um, let's go through some of your photos. We'll just take oh, through some of your photos. When you see these photos as we go, just what what comes to mind? Oh, these are wonderful little children. Uh, the Vietnamese families were very large. Um, they were very loving of each other. Yeah. Uh, this group of children was typical. Um, 
you would see them all over, uh, sitting in, even sitting in my uh, room at night, we had a little patio that mm. overlooked the street and you would see groups of children all the time, uh, but uh, suffer the little children. Yeah, uh, and when they saw you, they'd come looking for candy? They would come like looking that. for candy, right. Yeah. They would uh, learn a few English phrases, mm -hmm. typical, number one, number 10. <laughs> yeah. Number one being the best. Number, number one like being the best. The words, you, yeah. you number one, you yeah, know, you if you give them one. some candy. So in some contexts in the States, being number 10 is great, but there being number 10 was, that's as bad as it that got. That was right? not right. <laughs> this group here, I, I love this photo. This is uh, obviously a, a group of children uh, in the rural part of Vietnam. I wanted to put this on the cover of my book mm -hmm. because despite the war going on, uh, they still look relatively happy. The mm. young woman with the, holding the child on her hip looks a little despondent, but, mm. Mm. but uh, again, mm. it brings back so many. I said in the mm. early part of my book that few days, I've never had a day. I, I went to Vietnam as a young man, 33. Yeah. I'm now over 86, well over 86. Wow, yeah. No day has gone by since I left that country that my thoughts haven't gone back Wow. to that country. Yeah. And these, those, those young ones there now would probably be in their mid-50s? They uh, would be late, late uh, 50s, mid to late 50s, right? Yeah. 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 And you wonder what happened to them, yeah. if they survived. Yeah. Oh, here they are. This is, this is a typical medcap gathering. They're gathering to uh, try and be seen by one of the technicians or possibly a physician. Mm. They all gather well ahead of time knowing that we're going to be there. And uh, I point your attention way in the back, that little boy. Mm -hmm. He was uh, standing back there just wringing his hands, just wringing his hands, obviously mm. psychologically disturbed. And uh, mm. there were so many children like that with significant problems and uh, just no chance that no chance that they were going to be taken care of uh, in rural Vietnam at that mm. point in time. Yeah, mm. the, the, the one in the upper left Upper left, there. way back, yes. Do you, do you know anything about his story? I don't, or? I no. don't. I sought the little boy out and took him to see the physician, but the physician just, he couldn't deal with it in, under those circumstances, mm. you know. Now that looks like sand, is that China Beach by Da Nang there, do you know? or This photo a, here, it was in a village not too far from Da Nang, right? Oh, okay. We visited many of the villages on a rotational basis. We try to get there every okay. two weeks so that there was a possibility of follow-up. If you dressed a wound or something, you could at least uh, check on it and see how it was doing, that it wasn't infected. Yeah. These are refugee children. Uh, mm -hmm. sad, sad group of children here. I remember taking this one. It was just across the bridge from i -Corps. There was a little refugee village right at the base of the bridge. And... Uh, coming across the DMZ? No, coming across in Da Nang. Oh, in Da Nang. Coming okay. across the Da Nang River. Yeah. Uh, okay. i headquarters was on one side. In order for me to get to the Navy hospital, I had to cross the bridge and go toward China Beach. Okay, yeah. yeah. Wow. So refugees, meaning their village was destroyed by Viet Cong, or do you know what, what they were refugees from? Were Either they, from they the were North? fleeing violence from some village, yeah. or they were, yes, they were fleeing the Viet Cong. Yeah. Yes. And this woman, this is in a province hospital, and that's a story that's little known to uh, the American people. Almost every province hospital in Vietnam, there are 43 provinces in Vietnam, province being the equivalent, uh, political equivalent of a state, but about the size of a, con of a county. Mm -hmm. Each province had a province hospital. And the United States government, again, at a part of the humanitarian effort, put what was known as a MILFAP team, Military Provincial Health Assistance Program, 13 Americans serve in each of those province hospitals, three physicians and a number of technicians. Yeah. Not nurses, because the Vietnamese 
families provided nursing support. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but we supplemented these province hospitals in an attempt to train them to do things better and also to help them with the influx of the wounded. Train the nurses, the doctors. Training the nurses. Keep records. The, and exactly, like that. exactly. Yeah. Cleanliness, things like right. that. Yeah. Oh, this poor woman badly burned. How she was burned, I don't have a clue, but mm -hmm. she was so badly burned. And notice uh, just the stoic look on her face. And this was so typical of Vietnamese patients. They, mm. they rarely showed emotion. They would just uh, lay there, and you knew they had to be hurting, that the, yeah. that the pain had to be intense. Yeah. But they were stoic. You mentioned that, and and you, you mentioned sort of their stoicism in the in the in the face of this tremendous pain. I think you co you contrasted actually, if I remember right, with the responses of young American military personnel who were <laughs> wounded and how demonstrative they would yeah. be, understandably. But yeah, you you would go on. in the triage room at the Naval Support Activity Hospital, yeah. where the young Marines were brought from the battlefield, and it was bedlam. You know, they were screaming, they were praying, they were asking for their mother, they were praying the rosary, they were, you know, just very emotional. Mm. And you would go to Dewey Tan General Hospital, a thousand bed hospital where the Vietnamese casualties were brought in, and there was, it was quiet, it was quiet. A few low groans, mm. but uh, very little as the doctors and the nurses moved around uh, wow. tri triaging the patients. Do, do you think that's because the Vietnamese, I mean, just in the ordinary course of life, most of them had lives of what for Americans would be tremendous hardship. They, yeah. They'd almost grown accustomed to life of hardship, and this is more intense. It, but it, it, it could be. I never really did understand the dynamic, but yeah. it was, the difference was so much in contrast that you know, so apparent. That is interesting. Let's look at that. Let's go through a few, a few more of the photos. Oh, this little guy, he, uh, <laughs> his name was Ho Tien. Hmm. I saw him one day playing in the playground wow. uh, next to the cathedral in Da Nang. Yeah. And he was a kindergarten student uh, at Sacred Heart Elementary School. And uh, so I sought out his mother. It was almost Christmas time. I sought out his mother, and uh, she gave permission to take him to the Vietnamese hospital, or to the American hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, to see if perhaps we could help. And uh, the physician did a physical exam and found out that he was healthy enough to undergo surgery. And so just before Christmas time, 1966, uh, I took him, well, back up a little bit, mm -hmm. an NBC reporter by the name of David Burrington, was in Da Nang, and one day he came into my office and he said, look, I would like to do a NBC special on uh, the children that are being helped in the Navy hospital, and I've been referred to you. Hmm. And uh, he said, could you help me? He said, I'd like to focus on one person going through the system, and uh, I'd like to show it at Christmas time in the United States. And I said, uh, Mr. Burrington, it just happens that I've got a little boy right now hmm. who is getting ready for surgery. And I explained to him about Ho Tien. And uh, he was exceedingly interested. And to make a long story short, um, he did considerable amount of filming. He filmed the little boy prior to the surgery in his kindergarten classroom. He filmed him, us taking him and his mother to the hospital. He filmed part of the actual procedure and did quite a bit of footage on the follow-up on being reintroduced into his kindergarten classroom with his lip repaired. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, the camera work was not good. Oh, no, and so yeah. the NBC special became a three to five minute uh, squib that was shown on the Huntley Brinkley report right. just before Christmas okay. and then the next day on the Today Show which uh, which thrilled my family because they saw me in film. Oh, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. time. But yeah. uh, but at any rate, this little guy. Uh, Back to it. This yeah. little guy here, 
was representative of probably close to a hundred hair lips that one physician, Dr. John Henry Giles, mm. corrected. And uh, mm -hmm. in addition to, we, I call it a hair lip now, which would be politically incorrect. At that time, it was common terminology. Sure, it yeah. was even known as Operation Hair Lip <laughs> in Vietnam at yeah. that time. Yeah. But he corrected his cleft palate and his Definitely, cleft lip. Yeah. and. Uh, but he did it in about a hundred cases yeah. in Vietnam. And not only, not only that little boy, and not only hair lips, but external growths, uh, scar tissue that wouldn't allow sure. a person to raise an arm or open an eye. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of things that a general surgeon. And sure. Yeah, and you mentioned, I, I believe, this doctor, when things were sort of quiet, um, he wanted that, to keep in practice, and yeah, so he'd that, tell that, you to that, go, go find people and bring them to me. That, that's an interesting story, because yeah. uh, when I got to Vietnam, the very first Saturday that I was there, I went to the i -Corps staff meeting, and General Walt and General Lam, the Vietnamese commander, conducted the meeting, and uh, after the meeting was over, as they were exiting the room, military protocol, everybody stands. Sure. And General Walt and General Lam were exiting, and then my boss, who was following them immediately, uh, the commander of the advisory team number one, was a man named Colonel Arch Hamblin. Hmm. And they got by me and uh, Colonel Hamblin said, General Walt and General Lam, I'd like to introduce you to our new medical advisor. And uh, so they introduced themselves. I was shaking hands the steely eyes of General Walt, and he looked at me and he said, um, where are you coming from? Mm -hmm. I said, sir, graduate school, the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. He said, did they teach you anything? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. He said, what do you know about pacification? And I said, not nearly enough. And he mm -hmm. said, good answer. Yeah. He said, none of us know nearly enough. Mm -hmm. But he said, I can tell you this, keeping their babies alive is an important part of the process. Yeah, right. And I knew right then what his expectations were of me. Yeah. In addition to advising the Arvin, which took probably 70% of my time, he wanted me to get very much involved with the civilian population, yeah. and I did. Yeah. And the thing, two days later, I went to the Navy hospital, the U.S. Navy hospital, for a meeting with a commander to sort out what his expectations were of me. Casualties frequently got intermingled coming off of the battlefield. Casualties would, Vietnamese casualties would be mixed with the American casualties, mm. obviously had to be sorted out. And so I had this meeting and after the meeting, one of the physicians, the Navy physician who had attended the meeting said, hey, have you got just a minute? And I said, yeah. And so he introduced himself as Lieutenant Commander John Henry Giles. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're the new guy on the block. He said, you probably don't know this, but war is episodic in nature. He said, we'll have four or five days a week when things will be intensely busy, when I'm operating 16, 17 hours a day Wow. And he said, then suddenly the battle ends, the casualties are taken care of. And he said, there may be a couple of weeks of relative inactivity. He said, I don't like that. Mm. As a surgeon, he said, we just completed his residency. I need to stay active to keep my skills acute. And he proposed this civilian program. Yeah. He said, yeah. bring me the children of i -Corps. Who, who you think that a general surgeon, and he outlined mm. in broad terms mm. what types of things he could take care of. And so I did. And he set, with the commander's approval, he set two rooms aside to house their mothers while the children were in the wow. hospital being taken care of. Yeah. And so literally for, hundreds of cases yeah. he took care of. Yeah, so for people who dismiss the idea of pacification, that's, this is an, a, a counter story. It was it's for a counter real. story. It was for real. For, it was for, this, for real. For this this kid who, if he's still alive, is probably in his late fifties now. About fifty nine, uh, fifty eight. Yeah. Yeah. For him, it's a. I often think of him, 
I, I ran into him again, incidentally. Uh, at Christmas time, we took care of this little boy. Wow. And then at Easter time, I was driving by the cathedral in Da Nang, mm -hmm. Sacred Heart Cathedral, yeah. and uh, there was a huge gathering of people. Mm -hmm. They were out, obviously going to have an outdoor Good Friday uh, mm -hmm. service of some type. And I thought, I'd, as a Catholic, I thought, I'd really like to go to that. And do I dare? Do I dare? Because we were always warned, stay away from crowds. Right, yeah. The place where I lived was only about two blocks away from the cathedral. Mm. So I went mm -hmm. to my room, got out of uniform, got into civilian clothes, and walked back. And I walked to the edge of the crowd. I thought, I'll stay on the edge of the crowd, not get in the middle of the crowd. I got there about three minutes before the ceremony started. By the t time the ceremony started, I was enveloped by the crowd. Right, it just kept and you growing say in your and memoir, you're about a foot taller than everybody I am else about there. a foot taller. <laughs> and all there. of a sudden, there's a tug on my pant leg. Mm. I thought, whoa. I look down, there's that little boy this again, staring up at me yeah. with his repaired lip. Yeah. And he smiled at me, and then he, quick as a whip, he went, got his mother by the hand. She came back, mm. she looked up, she recognized me immediately, typical Oriental fashion, sure. bowed. It was wow. the most memorable Good Friday I've ever oh, had in my man. life. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if he is still alive, whatever else, um, whatever else he learned from the communists as they took over the country, he always, whether he is no longer living or still is, had the memory, has the memory of when uh, the United States military did something. And uh, not only and not him. only him, but many, uh, many, 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 but others. many, 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 a yeah. couple of hundred others as well. I think this is an important. This is an important. Uh, um, maybe the you know most important um, story of your memoir that the pacification of the hearts and minds things about which folks, you know, are sometimes cynical. That, yeah. But that it was for real. It yes, wasn't it was just, for uh, real. It was political nonsense. It absolutely was, it was for real. Well, let's let's go through some of your other photos. Then, oh, we've, we've yeah. seen that one. We'll go back. Oh, yeah. yes. This was taken near way. Uh, the Catholic sisters, the nuns, had a number of orphanages. And an orphanage in Vietnam is a bit different than an orphanage in the United States. An orphanage in Vietnam was open to all who, well, frequently a father would get killed and the mother is left with three or four children with uh -huh. no visible means of support whatsoever. So mm. temporarily it was perfectly all right for her to put her children in an orphanage. Oh, and the orphanages were open to people of all faiths. Mm. And most of these orphanages were run by religious groups? Most yeah. of them, practically all of them that I interacted with were, were run by religious groups. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You mentioned um, the, the mom of, the, of that little boy who came and thanked you. You do tell other stories that are sad stories where parents uh, almost inexplicably refuse to a lot of them, allow uh, their kids ma many to be Many of them, many of them refused, and uh, for a while I didn't understand it. But finally, I came to the conclusion after having my interpreter talk to them mm -hmm. in quite some length. Fear, the fear of the went. Viet Cong, retribution on the part of the Viet Cong. Uh, it was it was sad for me. So that, that's a good example of folks who are really caught between the two sides. It's caught a, it's between a lose, the two sides. Situation. Oh, and an, yeah. Another one when you were saying that that comes yeah. to mind is uh, quite some distance from Da Nang is a very poor city by the name of Tam Ki. Mm -hmm. And the head of the MILFAP team in Tam Ki uh, kept telling me about two children that had horrible hair, hair lips and he wanted them repaired, cleft palates and he wanted them repaired. And finally, he was able to convince the mothers to bring their children to Da Nang. And uh, he did, and he brought them to Da Nang. And sadly, one of the children was positive for tuberculosis, oh, right. making it yeah. impossible. So mm. we were able to correct one, but only one. Yeah. yeah. And Preston, please don't get the impression right. our discussion, we've, we're focusing on the pacification program a great deal. Sure. 
70% of my time was taken up advising the Arvin. Right. How so to clear their the battlefields yeah. of casualties, how to run their hospitals, how to keep sure. them supplied. Well, I think we have photos coming. Let's go back to the photos. Photos coming of Arvin forces. Oh, this horrible burns, huh? Horrible burns. Yeah. The mother trying, and again, notice the child not so screaming in agony and pain, and the mother trying to comfort the child as best she can. Wow. Hmm. This is an interesting one. One day, uh, an American came into my office near the close of business, and he started telling me a cockamamie story about how he was going to live with uh, the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong hmm. in order to get their perspective on the war because he was writing a book. Mm -hmm. Well, I listened patiently for a while and then said, look, I've got to go. And he said, oh, before you go, let me tell you about the boy in the shadows. Hmm. He was talking about that boy. Not this guy, yeah. That, that boy. Hmm. And he said there is a boy that is horribly disfigured. He yeah. said there is a boy that is horribly disfigured and he lives on Docklop Street, 97 Docklop, and he said you should drive down there. Mm -hmm. He said maybe something could be done to help this boy. Wow. So I thought, okay. So my interpreter and I drove down to a little bakery shop and uh, we went in the bakery shop and through my interpreter I asked the woman at the counter wow. if there was a boy that uh, that had a growth on the side of it. No, there's nobody here like that. Hmm. And uh, she, she was very reluctant to say anything more. Then I saw somebody walk by the beaded entryway. They use mm -hmm. beads to close yeah. it, you know, separate the beads. He walked by and looked perfectly normal. Nice looking young, tall for Vietnamese boy. And then he walked the other direction, mm. and I saw this on the side of his face. So we convinced her that we could help that boy. And we took him to the Navy hospital. It turned out that the growth you see is called a nevus. Hmm. It's called a nevus, and uh, it was removed, wow. and it just changed this young man's life. Wow. He came to visit me a couple of months later brought a gift, he was bearing a gift, mother of pearl plaque in gratitude and mm. wanted me to give one to the doctor as well. Wow. And I often think of this young man, he was probably 18 or 19 years old when mm. this photo was taken. So now he would be about 70, yeah. 65, wow. but imagine the impact on his life. Sure, yeah. Wow, well let's, let's keep rolling through. This is an Arvin soldier in one, yeah. of, one of their field medical units. Uh, obviously a very bad wound in the upper leg and uh, I don't know if this is a physician he's with or an Arvin medic. I suspect a non-commissioned officer just trying to quell, uh, stop the bleeding. Mm. Yeah, so you mentioned that most of your work is actually with... Uh, with, with the Vietnamese, Vietnamese absolutely. Vietnamese military. Yeah, the hospital in Da Nang was... Uh, one of the better in Vietnam. It was a very, very good hospital. Mm -hmm. It was called Dewey Tan General Hospital. The first time I walked through the hospital, I saw more death than I had in my previous 33 years. Wow. As we walked through the hospital with the wonderful man who was commanding it at that time, uh, three or four or five times he stopped as we walked through the hospital, take the pulse, cover the head. Wow. Hmm. That's something. Let's uh, let's go through some. Oh, here's a, oh, this is a wow. remarkable photo uh, here. A remarkable is photo, one? isn't it? Yeah. Um, taken at the Navy Hospital. One day um, when I was there, they brought a soldier in who had taken a mortar round in the shoulder, and the mortar had penetrated the skin and slid down along the rib cage. And they determined, the demolition people determined that it was a live weapon in there. And so the hospital commander insisted that he was going to take it out. So they sandbagged an area around so that put the patients in this sandbag enclosure 
and he and a couple of technicians removed it. And were the the um, demolition explosive demolition guys were they on they, the scene? They were absolutely there to. And as soon as they got that mortar round out, it, they disabled it. Absolutely, or? absolutely. Yeah, no, that was an Arvin soldier. No, that was an Arvin soldier. Arvin, Arvin yes, soldier. Arvin soldier. Good grief! Yeah, it was done at the Navy Hospital, U.S. Navy Hospital. An amazing thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just as heroic as, as any action on the battlefield. Good grief. This is an interesting photo, too. This is a photo of Dieter Dengler. Dieter was a Navy pilot, Lieutenant J.G., mm -hmm. and uh, he was shot down and became a prisoner of the path at Lao the communist in the country of Laos, of Laos yeah. and uh, he escaped from them and ran around the jungle for I think a month or thereabouts wow. and was eventually picked up by an Air Force helicopter and brought to the Navy hospital in Da Nang and this was the day that the very day that he came into that hospital and a movie was written a movie was produced about his life uh, Again, I can't remember the name of the movie, but mm. the, the person is Dieter Dengler. I'm sure yeah, if you did a Google search. Sure, yeah. Why, well, something. This is just so typical. This is taken in Da Nang. Uh, probably the people lived on those boats that you see there, mm. but this was so typical. And uh, both in Da Nang and Wei, and Hoi An, sure. a lot of people lived on the rivers and streams yeah. in these type of boats. Is this the Da Nang River? This is the Dividing Da Nang, Nang, Nang River. China Beach, mm -hmm. that, that area. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, the desolation, huh? Yeah. Every time I see this photo, I don't think it is of that village, but I think of Christmas Eve, 1966, mm. when a U.S. cargo plane, flying tiger cargo plane, in very bad weather, landed about a mile short of the Da Nang runway and crashed through a Vietnamese fishing village, just literally sweeping everything, everything within its wingspan, everything destroyed. Wow. And so on Christmas Eve, we were out there sorting through the debris. The, I was helping the Vietnamese health authorities deal with the casualties. I'm sure there were a lot from what it looks like. There were about 100 people that were killed oh at that, that yeah. night. The plane was malfunctioning, I'm guessing? Or no, it didn't malfunction. It was just the weather was so bad. I see. Okay. Yeah. This is an interesting photo also. This is a quite a typical Vietnamese um, funeral procession of an obviously wealthy person in Vietnam. Uh, the number of mourners that you have is important. And many times, if the person has the means, they will hire mourners <laughs> to come to their funeral. Mm. And this is crossing the Perfume River in Way, yeah. and you see the covering of the of the casket. And uh, there were the mourners were strung out for perhaps a hundred yards behind the really? casket. Yet wow. the family walks before the casket, and yeah. the mourners walk behind the casket. Mm. Burial customs were were quite different in Vietnam. Yeah, and we'll, I think we'll see some photos related to yeah. um, <clears> that. <throat> let me see, by early February 68, that bridge is knocked out, I think, as a result of the 68 Tet Offensive. 68 and the Tet Offensive, it was destroyed, right? Yeah. Uh, just uh, as a side note, the, the bridge that's replaced that one in way, uh, early in the morning, the local Vietnamese, a lot of local Vietnamese, go out on that bridge and do exercises and things like oh. that. So, yeah. Well, let's go back and uh, go back and what are we looking at here? You're looking at a Montagnard village over um, by, by Laos, uh, way up by uh, the Cam Lo area. And, uh, but it's just a typical Vietnamese home yeah. of the Montagnards. Yeah, and so as you know, the mountain yards were uh, fiercely loyal to the Americans. Yeah. Fiercely loyal. Ethnic minority within, within right. Vietnam. And when I think of the situation today with the Kurds, it reminds me oh, of... Maybe something like that. Of the mountain yards. On, yeah. the, on the way out to Quezon, uh, still you'll, you go through areas where the, yeah. the homes still look very yeah. much like that. 
this is an Arvin unit uh, in the staging area waiting for, waiting for a lift into combat. Mm. And uh, this is pretty typical. Uh, a lot of soldiers uh, lay there on their helmets, using their helmet as a place to rest on. Others having a smoke. At that time, uh, tobacco was used extensively. Sure. Yeah. But they're, they're waiting for a lift into combat. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> This is American humanitarian assistance again. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if this was the United States Agency for International Development or Catholic Relief Services, mm -hmm. but both were very active in providing uh, rice for the people. Sure. So much of the rice crops were disrupted during the war. Mm -hmm. um, a good deal of it was impacted by Agent Orange, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but even the war itself just disrupted the harvest and the planting. Yeah. And you, you mention uh, even you've got these uh, large organizations that are um, sending aid, but then you also message, mention uh, in the book that there's a woman, I, I think, was she in New Jersey, who would send you a lot of packages and w asking you somehow to she got this my ad thing. Somehow she got my address, and yeah. I would get a package almost every week from the woman from New Jersey, usually full of clothing for the refugee children. Yeah. And, I would pack, my, pack it in my briefcase, and when I saw a child in need, hand them a couple of items of clothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so people were involved. She, um, you say that she would get annoyed if you didn't res respond to everything. Absolutely. Every, every letter she wrote me. <laughs> she, she wanted to know her she, goodies were getting to the right place. Exactly, so, and so yeah. I just didn't have the time to sure. respond to yeah. all of these things. But good, good motivation, huh? This, uh, again, in a province hospital is not the military hospital, but for civilians in the provincial hospital. Mm. And the norm was uh, usually two patients per bed. It doesn't yeah, show wow. in here, but yeah. the norm was two patients per bed. Mm. Are those Americans? Those are. This there? is a member of the MILFAP team, mm -hmm. and an American doctor, and uh, yeah. they did yeoman's work, believe me. Yeah. The MILFAP teams were just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Again, mil MILFAP, meaning military assistance, to provin military provincial health assistance program, mm. helping the civilian yeah. casualties of war. That's another example of the Hearts and Minds program being a yes. real classification. Uh, this American uh, members of, of an advisory team in Hoi An, and this was in a in a prisoner of war compound down there. Actually, it was. I don't, I don't know if you'd call it a prisoner of war camp. It was mm. suspected Viet Cong. Oh, okay. It was a place to hold them, yeah. and here we are vac vaccinating against typhus. Okay. So even suspected VC are being, exactly. sure, being taken care of. Yeah. Uh, just a Buddhist bonds and a little boy uh, walking mm. through the streets of Da Nang, just an interesting street scene. Is he a Buddhist? Bonds, I guess, is the word that's sort of a Buddhist priest. Or yes. Something. Is that the young man, a Bonds in training? He is. Right? He's okay. a young man who is contemplating becoming a Buddhist Bonds. Yeah. Another just of the desolation of war. Yeah. Unbelievable destruction. Street scene in Da Nang again. Uh, market day. Uh, women come to buy their vegetables and their fruits and their meats. Uh, yeah. to, the, to the central marketplace and uh, yeah. the conical hats that are so so prevalent throughout the country. And the, the feet I can see mostly look bare. I'm seeing a lot of bare feet there. As At least just, I can't see a lot, but it yeah. seems like a lot of folks walk around barefoot. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and this tragic photo, huh? Yeah. So tragic. Yeah. You just see the desperation in the man's eyes, you know, wondering, where does he go from here? Mm. War is so hard on the elderly. So, what, was, do you recall, was, is this the aftermath of a battle, or is this from that plane crash? Or This recall? is the aftermath of a different battle, aftermath a rocket battle. attack. Oh. Yes. Folks caught in the middle. The Vietnamese, this is an Arvin funeral, Army of the Republic of Vietnam soldier, and their burial customs were quite different. Um, they did not embalm, and so when, a, when an Arvin casualty came in, and I saw a lot of them, uh, when they would come into the hospital, Dewey Tan, mm. they would take them to the morgue, a separate building, good distance away from the hospital. They would clean the body, wash it, 
They would then uh, wrap it in a white shroud. White is the burial hmm. garment there, white yeah. shroud. They would put uh, circles of cloth over each eye, hmm. red as I recall. It was either red or black. Red, I'm almost certain. Put over each eye, and why this was done, I don't know. Hmm. But then they would, they would place the person in the coffin, and to stabilize the body, they would put sand on either side, hmm. and then on the sand, they would put lime to keep down the incidence of bugs, to oh, keep down the stench. Yeah. And then yeah. they, would cover, they would cover the casket with a flag, and the family would gather. You saw the tent out there. The family sure. would gather mm -hmm. to say goodbye. And typically, the burial would take place within two to three days after, after okay. the death. This is the same sort same of thing. thing same thing. Candles, here. incense, strong sense of incense. Yeah. As as you know, the Buddhist beliefs are in reincarnation, yeah. and the period immediately after death is very important because then they think the spirit is leaving the body, according to the Buddha's belief, and being transformed okay. into something yeah. else, either another human being or possibly a lower animal. Depending on how you did. Depending on how you lived your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We've, we've seen that. Yeah. This is this is aftermath of a battle. Yeah, aftermath of a battle again. Little children trying to survive, living outside of this tent. This is in a refugee village again. Uh, we had a couple of mass uh, evacuations, trying to clear areas where fire was coming at us trying to create a free, free fire zone. Mm. Frequently, uh, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong or the NVA would put their gun emplacements in the DMZ, right in the DMZ itself, hmm. and then fire on us with impunity, wow. thinking we weren't going to return fire yeah. because it was in a village. Oh, and so gosh. we had a couple of evacuations. We just had to clear that area. And so 25 or 30,000 people were moved from the DMZ into the Cam Lo area and the Quang Tri area. Mm. Of course, a lot of them don't want to be moved. And, yeah, an and interesting story. Problems. Yes, an yeah. interesting story there too. Um, just to demonstrate General Walt's concern for the civilians, mm. Mm. Uh, I reported to him at one staff meeting that one of the problems we were having that many of the women who had tiny babies stopped lactating mm. during the war, during the evacuation, which is not atypical at all. You know, mm. any dis, any emotional Distress disruption and, like sure. that, and and that we just didn't have a source of milk in the country. We just didn't have a source of milk. General Walt dispatched an aircraft to Hong Kong to pick up milk, to wow. pick up condensed milk. Was this part of your mission to Hong Kong that you? No, well, my mission okay. to Hong Kong was quite different. It was to procure equipment for the kitchen. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Now, one of the things I noticed about that was when you were in Hong Kong, there were communist-inspired riots. Absolutely. The exact opposite of today. Uh, yeah, and, as we're, and at the time we were recording this, we've had a long string of anti-communist-inspired yes. riots in yes. Hong Kong. So. When I was in Hong Kong, the chant was, the East is red, the East is red, the East is red. They mm. kept yelling and yelling and yelling. Yeah. Mm. Then you get a taste of what communism actually is and realize you do. Uh, prefer I saw, something else. I saw enough of communism in Eastern Europe too. I bet you did. I don't need yeah. I don't need communism. Yeah. And this is a med cap. This is the Medical Civic Action Program, mm. where typically uh, uh, both the Vietnamese soldiers are friends, friendly forces, mm -hmm. and the Americans sponsored MedCap teams, they were called, that would take care of villages on a rotational basis. Every two weeks they would try to visit and they would see a, a physician sometimes, or usually a medical technician, mm. An LVN equivalent, uh -huh. and uh, they would take care of a lot of cuts and bruises, and especially large amounts of pink eye and mm. lance boils and uh, just yeah. sure. first aid type of things. Yeah, yeah. 
again, this is another example of benefiting the lives of, of the folks who are there. Yeah, yeah I'm just... These. There's an, ama an amazing man right there. He's the man who, the day I arrived in Da Nang, um, I didn't know if the yeah. commander of Dewey Tan General Hospital was a friend or a foe. Mm. There had been a Buddhist uprising in Da Nang about two months before I arrived when blood literally flowed on the streets of Da Nang mm. where the Buddhists were demanding a louder voice in the government. Right. And Com Premier Ki, Win Kao Ki, uh, mistakenly, according to most Americans who were on the scene, uh, replaced the corps commander. He was a beloved guy. He was a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. He was a capable leader. Uh, his name was General T. And uh, for some reason, Ki, the premier, wanted him to deal more ruthlessly to put down this insurrection, this mm -hmm. uprising, mm -hmm. and T refused to do so. Yeah. So Premier Key had him removed from command, and they went through three corps commanders in a space of three months. Wow. And then finally, Premier Key brought his airborne forces in there to put down the insurrection, and mm -hmm. blood flowed on the streets of Da Nang of our friendlies, of people that were yeah. pro-government. All they wanted was a louder voice in their, in their government. So almost a civil war within a civil war. Almost a civil war. And at yeah. any rate, when I arrived in Da Nang, the man that you just saw was working in two capacities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go back to that film. Mm -hmm. He was, in addition to being the I Corps surgeon, uh -huh. he was also commanding on a temporary basis, Dewey Tan General Hospital. His name was uh, uh, Pham Viet Tu, mm. and he was an internist serving the grade of major, commanding a thousand bed hospital, and serving as the Corps surgeon at the wow. same time. Yeah. He turned out to be a very good friend of mine, but when I arrived, nobody knew for sure if he had joined the insurrection or not. The Buddhist insurrection. The Buddhist oh. insurrection. Yeah. And he's the man I told you about that I walked through the hospital with, and he almost oh, reverentially covered the heads of the deceased. Yeah. I knew in my heart right then and there yeah. that he was a good man. Yeah. And he turned out to be a wonderful friend. Yeah. And I still correspond with him. You he do. now lives in Brisbane, Australia. He's in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, did he have to face reprisals when the North Vietnamese did he shut ever, down? Did he ever. Yeah. Um, when the Vietnamese took over um, 30th of April 1975, uh, he was put in a communist re-education camp for three years. Wow. And his family, wife and six children, same type of family I had, four daughters and two sons, they were left to fend for themselves. Mm. and. They were denied all opportunities to go to school, the children. Uh, when he got out of his communist re-education camp, he and his wife decided they just had to get out of that country. They made two unsuccessful attempts, expending almost all of their savings hmm. to get out. Neither attempt worked. One time, a navigational part error on the part of the small boat, and another time the boat itself was, it was made for the coastal waterways, not for the open seas, mm. and they had to be rescued at sea and mm. brought back to Vietnam. Mm. Then, yeah. listen to this, he decided to divide his family into two groups, three in each group, and gave them an order. Wherever you go, tell them you want to go to Australia. Tell them you want to go to Australia. And he sent they sent these two groups of children away from Vietnam, away from them, and lo and behold, they made it to Australia. Wow. And two yeah. years later, he and his wife were allowed to leave Vietnam under a family reunification plan 
and they joined them in Australia. Do you, do you know when this was? Was this in the 70s or the 80s? When this when would have out? been this would have been uh, in the late 70s. The late 70s. In the late 70s. I mean, this this continued at least into the late 80s. The yes. aircraft carrier I was on in the Pacific. At one point, we rescued uh, a group of Vietnamese in a boat that was sinking. And they really? Were, they were refugees as really? well. Really? Yeah, that must have been 87, 88, something but, like but that. But that, that wonderful friend of mine, uh, Dr. Tu, uh, yeah. he was an internist, as I told you. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he got to Australia, they would not grant him medical privileges. They wouldn't recognize, they wouldn't certify him. Mm -hmm. And so instead of uh, taking the defeatist attitude, he went back to school and he became mm -hmm. a PhD in public health okay. and contributed in that capacity. Yeah, and uh, so he's, he's in Australia now? He is in Australia. His okay. wife is now deceased, but oh. he's living a nice life in retirement in Australia with his, with his family of six children. Wow, let's go to the next one. And this man likewise, this is a wonderful friend too, and he now lives in Mission City, California. And he too, at the time of the Vietnamese War, he was not married, he was a bachelor. And he was an orthopedic surgeon. And when I arrived in Da Nang, he was theoretically the commander of Dui Tan General Hospital, but he had been removed temporarily to go back to Saigon to help them with some special project. And that's why the other man was serving as the acting commander. But mm. he was the commander of Dui Tan General Hospital and uh, later in the war, they sent him to Canada to become a spine surgeon because they were having so many problems mm. with serious spine injuries. Did the government of South Vietnam send him to Canada? The so, government of Vietnam, the okay. army of Vietnam sent yeah. him to Canada. Huh. But he too turned out to be just a wonderful, loyal friend. Hmm. And was his experience in Vietnam after the North Vietnamese uh, won that war, was it similar? To similar, the, through, through the three, three years in the re-education camp, yeah. and then he eventually made his way to the United States. Exactly how he got here, I do not know. I, I do not know. Okay, wow. Well, as we, uh, as we wind down, I mean, first of all, thank you for the memoir, and, and thank you for talking about it. It does, it's just such a, Tremendous contrast uh, with a conversation I had just a few days ago, again with a veteran who um, was very much in the body count side of that war, yeah. 69, 70s, when yeah. he was there, uh, part of the um, invasion into, into Cambodia. When you look back on that, on that war, you, you mentioned that um, you know, all these years later, more than 50 years later, uh, not a day goes by that Vietnam yeah. doesn't, doesn't yeah. pass through your mind. Um, what do you think is important for people today to know about the Vietnam War? Uh, I think it's important that they know that the cause was just, that indeed uh, communism was on the move in Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's important that they know it's important that we stick it out with a friend. Mm -hmm. uh, it bothers me greatly that we abandoned that country. We went into that country on our own volition. When you look back at the history, we were involved in that country way back when the Truman administration, mm -hmm. then the Eisenhower administration, Kennedy ups the ante, puts in 25,000 advisors, Lyndon Johnson then commits combat forces, and of course Richard Nixon inherits it upon, upon the uh, decision by Lyndon Johnson not to seek re-election. Yeah. And so uh, we abandoned that country, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Do you remember feeling that in, in 75 when those powerful images come across the news wires mm -hmm. of, you know, the last Americans scrambling to get on the helicopter? I can't tell you how that stuff. impacted me personally. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm probably the closest I've ever come to being depressed. I'm a pretty optimistic guy, but I'll tell you, as all the aftermath and the boat people mm. and the decisions about where they can go and where they can't go and the countries that were refusing to take them. Mm. Because mm -hmm. this, is a, this was a wonderful people. They were resilient, yeah. they were bright, mm. they wanted to learn. What many Americans fail to realize is that at the time the war started, uh, so few of the people were literate. 
-hmm. So few of the people were literate, mm -hmm. and I can't help but think that that's one of the factors why the American soldiers looked upon them as unmotivated because mm -hmm. they couldn't read, but yeah. there are other ways that they wanted to learn. Believe me, they wanted to learn. Yeah. You know, there are two things that, that come to mind. There's that famous image, of course, of 1975 of the people scrambling up the steps to get on that helicopter yes. near the American Embassy in Saigon. That building is still there. And, and, oh, uh, is it? Yeah, and it was incredible to see it. But what's across the street from it now is a luxury mall. Uh, so capitalism wins. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, a, that's the one yeah. message I get, from, yeah. I get from that. And then just something else I saw the other day in a recent um, uh, international ranking um, by a group uh, that is you know, generally respected, right. so it's not an ideological thing. Uh, Vietnamese students, um, it's sad to say as an American, but Vietnamese students actually outperformed their American peers in reading, writing, and science. Today. Yeah, reading, Today. writing, mathematics. Isn't that yeah, something? That's right. Yeah. The country's so made great strides. It, it, it seems clearly on the rise. There is a tremendous energy. Places you mention in the memoir, which I don't, you wouldn't recognize now. Da Nang is yeah. a resort town. Yeah. Hoi An is a tourist town. And, and it clearly is a, a country on the rise. It's, um, as you say, the, you know, communism was on the march and it did take over that country. And unfortunately, a, a couple generations of Vietnamese were lost to yeah. it. But um, it seems like they're on, they're on the way, at least in economic yeah. terms, to joining the, the market. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many, so many poignant memories that I have of that country. And, mm -hmm. You know, the men and women, for the almost overwhelmingly, were good people that we sent to Vietnam. That's why an incident like My Le impacted me so, so mm -hmm. deeply. Yeah. You know, right, like a stab in the heart. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, you know, most Americans when they go to war, they take their he sense of humanity with them, and uh, clearly. The Callies of the world did mm -hmm. not. The lieutenant in, in, in command there at Milai and Exactly. Yeah, when the, the news of that broke. And unfortunately, that is the kind of stuff that sticks in the... To the extent that Americans have historical yeah. memory, right. that, that is the stuff that sticks in the historical memory. Not, unfortunately, the work you were doing and what General Walt was really advocating, yeah. that if we're going to win this thing, pacification yeah. has to yeah. be a major component yeah. of that. So yeah. many of the soldiers take a, a bad rap, I think, you know, when a lot of people think of Vietnam, they think of rampant drug use. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there was drug use. Not when I was there. I never saw drug used yeah. illegally. Yeah. It seems to me almost that there were two different wars. I think that's right. Yeah. The war from 65 to mid-68 was one war, and that which came after was quite different when... Yeah, I've heard veterans who served two tours and experienced that divide, and, right. they, and they often right. describe that. We all yeah. s see the war through our own lens, sure. and that yeah. gets back to this, how we see the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Mm. I see it through my filter, they see it through their mm -hmm. filter. I'm not saying they're wrong, sure. but uh, yeah. you know, I, the people that I saw were good yeah. people. Well, and that, so that, that gets back to um, really the, the, the reason you're here <coughs> is um, the, the memoir you wrote. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you did because it does, it, 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 as the title says, it, it presents a, a different face mm -hmm. of the war. And all that other stuff is real, but this is real as well. This and and it's important for folks to have a comprehensive uh, sense of, of everything that was going on in this incredibly complicated situation. I just there. appreciate your effort, Dr. Jones, to oh, well, put it all you. together and to yeah. make it available to the American people because there truly is a different side of the Vietnam War. Yeah. Well, and, and the humanitarian side gets relatively little attention. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the Daily News, history focuses on the negative. Right. So it's nice every once in a while to pause and say, but right. there, there, was, there was other stuff to right. see. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Stratton. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thank you. You bet.